Hi everyone, uh, my name is Uzair Jamil. Uh, I'm a second year PhD uh, working at FAST Lab under the supervision of Dr. Joshua Pierce. Uh, the topic of my thesis, my PhD is agrivoltaics. Uh, so without further ado, I'll just begin with my presentation. In my presentation, I'll just be covering uh, the main implementation strategies and types of agrivoltaics, just so that we are all on the same page. And then I'll be recapping what has been done in the field of agrivoltaics in the last year. So what agrivoltaics is, uh, as you can understand from the word itself, it comes from agriculture, agri, and from photovoltaics, voltaics. So it is basically a combination of agriculture and photovoltaics. It is the dual use of land for the purpose of agriculture and electricity generation through PV. Um, these are the pictures that basically represent what uh, an agrivoltaic field looks like. So you have solar PV and then on, on farmland and then you grow crops underneath them. The idea is that those solar panels are strategically placed so that there is no adverse impact on farmland. This is the slide which is going to shake some of your beliefs. The, natural, the general idea is that when you are going to shade the crops, the crop yield is going to decrease, right? Uh, it, ha it is only going to adversely affect. This is the general perception, but it is not the case. What research has shown us is that instead of uh, the crop yield being decreased, we can have increased uh, crop yield just by shading them and giving the crops optimum amount of light. So I have recapped uh, the research uh, that has been done all over the world and included the best crop yields from the past. So if you look at corn, um, uh, the, the research was done in Japan and it showed that you can have 5.6% increased corn yield just by putting in agrivoltaics. Uh, Similarly, a research was done in Germany uh, on celeriac, and it showed 12% increase in, in crop yield. Uh, similarly, if you go on to USA, uh, tomato and pepper, they showed any amount, uh, I mean, uh, an increased amount of crop yield, almost 90 and 150%. This research was done in uh, USA, Arizona. Uh, similarly, coming to bell peppers, another study done in US, it showed 40% increase in crop yield. So this slide just summarizes that Agrivoltaics doesn't impact the farmland negatively. Instead, there is uh, a chance to increase crop yield just incorporating agrivoltaics. Uh, some of the application strategies that can be used or that can be implemented through agrivoltaics. So these are the six main types or applications of agrivoltaics. Uh, we can generally have normal crop production in between the rows. So what you do is you space your solar panels such that you can have rows of crops in between them. The second type is animal husbandry, which is you can have uh, sheep grazing, rabbit grazing in between the solar panels or underneath the solar panels. Uh, then you have ecosystem services as well. So with agrivoltaics, you can grow vegetation underneath the panels, which of course has the ecosystem. Uh, with regards to crop production, uh, you can have different types of uh, Im uh, implementation racking designs. Uh, so for instance, you can have uh, regular reinforced polar mounts. Uh, uh, you can have vertical mounted uh, racking designs. You can have uh, tracking systems, so which track the sun throughout, throughout the day. Also, you can have elevated solar panels, which are also known as stilt mounted. So you increase the height of the solar module such that you can do farming underneath them. These are like four meters or five meters high as well. And of course, you can have the greenhouse solar as well, so in which you have a greenhouse, and you put the solar panels on top of the greenhouse. You can crop, uh, you can do the cropping underneath the greenhouse, and you have solar panels covered covering the greenhouse, which can use, be used to generate electricity. The three main strategies that are normally housed and normally used in agrivoltaics are these three. Uh, the stilt-mounted agrivoltaics that I have described, you have the solar panels mounted quite high up uh, uh, in the field. The height could be as high as like four meters and five meters high, and then you can do the vegetation and the cropping underneath them. Between the row agrivoltaics, this is a picture from Germany. So they are doing like vertical, uh, vertical PV racks, and then they have the field in between the in between the PV panels in which you can do vegetation and uh, cropping. And lastly, agrivoltaic greenhouses. So you can have the the panels of the of the greenhouse converted into or transformed into with solar panels, changed with solar panels, so that uh, you can have uh, electricity generated from them. And then you can of course do the cropping uh, inside your greenhouse. Uh, now coming to the research that has been done uh, over the last year, uh, the first uh, uh, the first paper that uh, I'm discussing is on a life cycle analysis, uh, and it was for sheep agrivoltaics. The research was conducted in USA. Uh, and they basically uh, uh, estimated the carbon dioxide emissions and ecotoxicity 
uh, if you incorporate sheep agrivoltaics uh, into your farmland. And the results were amazing. Like uh, the results showed that you have 3. Point less, 9 percent less emissions, and almost 0.5 percent less energy demand if you have uh, an integrated system in which you are doing sheep grazing on uh, through on your PV uh, on your PV land, if, as compared to if you are doing the two things separately on separate piece of land. Uh, this research was done in in India, and it was conducted on turmeric. Uh, a 0.675 kilowatt uh, of system was installed, and it showed that the land equivalent ratio and the payback periods were like 1.73 and 9.49 years. Uh, the land equivalent ratio is basically a terminology that is used to uh, identify if the combined use of PV and agriculture would uh, would be beneficial or not. So uh, a ratio of greater than one means that if you have separate pieces of land for PV production and agriculture, the agrivoltaics is beating it and it's providing you more benefits. Uh, the research also showed that the temperature levels were decreased for the solar panels. It was almost 1 and 1.5 degrees centigrade less uh, because you are going crops underneath them. So of course, uh, that has an impact on microclimate and it reduces the temperature of the solar panels. Uh, by reducing the temperature of the solar panels, what you are basically doing is you are increasing the efficiency of your PV, right? Of your PV system. As you reduce the temperature, it's, it becomes more efficient. Uh, lastly, the production, like the yield. So there was a slight reduction in yield. Uh, if you could consider the control production, which is just normal farmland, uh, it was 18.5 kg, uh, with, whereas with AV production, it was 16 kilogram, but it was not that much. This is a very interesting research that was conducted in China. Uh, they are basically transforming their barren lands, like deserts, and converting them into like nice grasslands and vegetation. Uh, so what they did was, uh, if you can see the pictures as well, this was uh, the piece of land before uh, they incorporated agrivoltaics, and this is after what they have done uh, with agrivoltaics. Uh, so with, by incorporating agrivoltaics on a barren piece of land, the vegetation cover increased to 90%, which was previously like 1%. There was no, no vegetation there. Uh, and if they, this system is basically a 200 megawatt system that they have incorporated in China. They have built it in China. And if you look at the 25-year life cycle, uh, the numbers are amazing when it compares to uh, comparison with, like, for instance, producing the same amount of energy with coal. So if it's like uh, if you have been producing the same amount of energy using coal, it would save 1.63 million tons of coal. The emission reduction is 4.53 million tons. Uh, SOX and NOx uh, have a considerable reduction as well. Uh, and the water saving, because when you are incorporating solar PVs, uh, the evaporation of course, reduces as well. So that is uh, humongous as well. So 9.12 million tons uh, of uh, water savings can be done. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the best part was that it, it uh, created job opportunities for, for people. So 120 to 150 new jobs were created when, you when they installed the solar modules and the agrivoltaic system there. And almost 1,000 uh, 1, farmers increased their income as well because it provides a dual revenue stream. One is through farming, and the other through, through selling electricity. Coming to Europe, uh, a sugar beets experiment was conducted uh, with agrivoltaics. Uh, it showed that almost 26% reduction of uh, of yield was uh, was observed with a solar tracking system. So they basically conducted experiments with different types of tracking designs. One was solar tracking system, which is a single axis tracking system. Uh, so that showed a reduction of almost 26%. With the vertical setup, it showed 20% reduction in yield. Uh, while for the smart tracking configuration, which basically tracks, uh, controls the solar module's orientation, keeping in mind uh, whether you want to produce more energy or whether you want to give more sunlight to the plants. So it's an algorithm that they have created. So it resulted in a reduction of almost 15% of yield. Soybeans were tested in Italy uh, and under four different shading treatments. So they did like 27% shading, 16% shading, 9% shading, and 18% shading. Uh, so the number of pots for soybean that reduced were almost 13%. Whereas the grain yield reduction was almost 8.6, ranged from 4.6 to 11% for three configurations. Whereas one configuration, which is AV2, which is 16% uh, shading levels, it in instead increased the yield of, uh, of, of the soybean to about 4.4%. Another study that was conducted in China that basically uh, focused on water conservation part of, uh, of agrivoltaics. 
uh, through two different uh, agrivoltaics regime. One was the concentrated agrivoltaic system in which you have uh, parabolic troughs that direct sunlight towards a solar panel and uh, allow some of the sunlight to pass through it, which is the red and the far red spectrum. And uh, the other one was the even lighting agrivoltaic system in which you have a specially made glass in between two solar modules that disperses the sunlight when it passes through it so that the crops that are rightly underneath the solar panels get some amount of light as well. So they tested these two systems and it showed that almost uh, 20, 14 to like 33 percent of uh, water conservation is possible. Uh, another study that was conducted in USA uh, at Purdue University uh, was done for maize. Uh, this showed that uh, the amount of uh, yield reduction for agrivoltaics was almost 11.95 metric tons, whereas for control yield it was almost 12.95 metric tons. So there was a little bit of uh, yield reduction, but it wasn't that much. And they did it for a single axis tracking system. Uh, I included this slide uh, thanks to uh, our, our partners from, from National Re 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 Renewable Energy Laboratory from USA. Uh, so this basically summarizes uh, the, uh, the agrivoltaics uh, sites in USA. Uh, if you see that uh, uh, the number of sites uh, in, uh, that are uh, using agrivoltaics uh, that have employed agrivoltaics is more than 400 in, in, 400 in US. So this shows how far ahead U.S. is when we compare to when we compare to Canada. Uh, there are a lot of systems that range in one to five megawatts, almost more than 100 sites uh, that are housing uh, agrivoltaics that range from one to five megawatts. And similarly, there are uh, five to 25 acres of land have like they are the most ones that are incorporating agrivoltaics farmlands. And the total megawatts is almost greater than six gigawatts, six six thousand megawatts. In the next few slides, these are some of the things or some of the research work that me and Dr. Pierce have been doing on agrivoltaics. Uh, this uh, is a paper that we published which focused on specialized racking designs for agrivoltaics. So with agrivoltaics, you know that we need to farm and we need to crop underneath the panel. So the panel should be at a certain height. So these are the uh, racking designs that uh, are almost two meters high. So farmers can work underneath them. Uh, the best part about them is that they are made of wood, which is sustainable, and uh, they are cheap as well. So these racks are almost 50% less costly as compared to the commercial ones, commercial designs. Uh, the same project was done in British Columbia, uh, thanks to Jeremy and uh, my friend Jacob. Uh, yeah, Jacob is there. So my friend Jacob, we, did, we built these racks in, in Okanagan uh, in July, August. Uh, so it was a really nice experience, and as far as I know, these are the first specialized agrivoltaic designs, uh, agrivoltaic rackings that have been uh, built in, ok in Okanagan, BC. So I'm extremely proud of that. Uh, another research that we, we did was for Alberta. Uh, the province of Alberta has tremendous potential uh, when it comes to solar. So we did a policy review for, uh, for Alberta in which we uh, evaluated uh, and reviewed the legislation that can have an impact on agrivoltaics. Uh, so we went through a lot of, uh, a lot of laws and policies. Uh, I've mentioned some of them. So for instance, land use framework. This is the main governing document that uh, defines what types of uses your land can have in Alberta. It divides, your, uh, it divides the, uh, the land of the province into two parts. One is white land, the other one is the green area. The green area is generally public land and it's related to forestry, whereas the white land is generally related to settled areas. Um, and it defined has seven different strategies that tells you that how can you use those lands. Uh, to maintain agricultural land, uh, they use uh, Alberta Land Stewardship Act, which is the document that uh, implements uh, land use framework. And in that document, they have uh, tools such as regional planning. So you can zone out your, so they can zone out your, the, the agricultural land so that there is no work be, uh, or no development done on agricultural land. Similarly, they have tools like conservation directives and easements, which can basically, pro which, is, which are there to protect and conserve uh, farmland. Uh, there are, then there is Municipal Government Act, which is the main legislative document uh, that uh, governs municipalities. And in those documents as well, they can have tools such, uh, which can basically be used to protect and conserve farmland. 
Bill 22, uh, this, is, uh, this was one of the most talked documents uh, that uh, came up uh, just, uh, just uh, a few months ago. And it is, uh, in, in Alberta, uh, there is basically uh, an embargo or it doesn't allow you to self-supply and export electricity. But when the bill in 22 was introduced, it basically allowed uh, uh, facilities to self-supply and export electricity as well, which is, uh, which, which is very nice for agrivoltaics, especially for farmers, because they can have this system uh, installed on their farmland. And then they can, of course, cater their needs with, with that, with that uh, system as well. And if they have like, excess electricity, they can uh, provide it to the grid. Uh, another study that we conducted was for Saskatchewan, which is the agricultural powerhouse for, uh, for, for Canada. Uh, and this study basically examined that if you have increased biomass yield, what was the impact on, uh, on, on, on livestock? So we uh, studied normal pasture uh, and uh, we studied wheat. Uh, the numbers for the increased yield were taken from literature. So for instance, for wheat, we considered like 3% increase in yield, which uh, th this is a study that has been done in Germany. And we also kind of used uh, a study from US uh, to, under, uh, to estimate the increase in, in pasture. And the numbers, were, the numbers are staggering. Uh, I'll just uh, discuss the, the revenue that, that can be increased from, uh, from agrivoltaics. It ranges from 247 billion to about $1,310 billion. That can just be, uh, uh, this revenue can just be increased by incorporating agrivoltaics on farmland using pasture and weed inside Saskatchewan. The four percent solution for Canada, uh, another study that we conducted was that we, uh, we estimated all the farmland that is uh, present in Canada, and uh, we uh, estimated the potential of agrivoltaics on that farmland. So the numbers, again, are, are, are staggering. Uh, if we only use 1% of agricultural land to employ agrivoltaics, we can cater almost 30 to 40% of Canada's electricity needs. We don't need anything else. And if we use 4% of the, of the agricultural land, we, we can just cater the complete need of uh, electricity through agrivoltaics. And as far as the emissions and the uh, carbon and the greenhouse gases are concerned, uh, only using one percent of farmland, we can do away with all the uh, all the emissions that are being uh, uh, generated from from uh, from the electricity grid. So this is my last slide. Uh, do agrivoltaics improve public support? This was a study that was done in the U.S. Uh, it shows that almost eighty-two percent people are more inclined towards solar PV and uh, PV based electricity generation if they are told that their farmland can have dual use through PV uh, by generating electricity on that and they can still continue doing farming as well. So yeah, thank you so much for listening to me. If there are any questions, happy to answer them. <laughs>